Well, hello everyone. Um, this is a, a short video in which I'm going to try to give you some context for understanding the book The Fifth Risk by Michael Lewis. I'll talk a bit about, uh, I think, some of the issues that the book addresses. I'm not going to go through the content of the book in too much detail because I know you're going to read it and that's the whole point, but I want to put it in a context so you can understand it. I also want to show you some um, pictures of some of the people who are uh, in the book so you can just maybe have a little fuller understanding of what kind of people they are and um, kind of get an image of them in your head and maybe help you remember who they were. I, sometimes you put a face with a, a name, it's easier to remember. But most of all, I want to get across the general sense of what the book is about and, and how, why I'm asking you to read it. So um, first, let me just go over something that has happened in our culture over the last, oh, 60 years or so. Um, this, uh, this is a chart, or a graph, I should say, that um, charts responses to the question um, uh, uh, that is asked in opinion surveys all the time about people, whether they trust the government in Washington to do the right thing or not. And they'll ask them to rate it, you know, I think they always do, most of the time, hardly ever, you know, how often do you think the government in Washington does the, the right thing? And if you look there at the left of the chart, you can see it starts in about the late 50s under uh, Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, and runs up through the Trump administration. And you can see, if you look closely at it, that um, kind of gold line is the, um, uh, the dark line, is a moving average of the percentage of people who think the government does the right thing always or most of the time. So this is basically a line of people, the percentage of the American population that basically trusts the government in Washington to do the right thing. You can see that under uh, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and at the beginning of the Johnson administration in the, in the 60s, almost you know, 75 to 80 percent of the public thought the government in Washington usually did the right thing. And that began to plummet dramatically under Johnson, further under Nixon, even more under Ford, more under Carter, popped up a bit under Reagan, then began to go down again under Bush. And you can see what happened there. There's a spike under the first Bush um, for the trust going up during the Gulf War, and then it plummeted back down again. He was not reelected. Trust went up under Clinton, and then has gone basically down ever since. So we're back down to the point where only about 20% of the public thinks the government in Washington usually or most, most of the time or always does the right thing. That is a major problem, and it has changed over time um, dramatically. and we need to ask ourselves a number of questions like, for example, why? Um, you know, why did so many Americans lose confidence in the federal government? Um, and, you know, there are many possible explanations. One is that uh, scandals, there have been scandals and there have been wars that we lost, the war in Vietnam uh, under, you, you saw where it began to go down under Johnson. Well, a lot of that had to do with the war in Vietnam, um, a war that we lost and we have lost several wars. And this leads people to lose confidence in the government's ability to do one of its important functions, which is um, waging war, defending the country, this sort of thing. Um, and also there have been scandals, scandals like Watergate, which caused confidence to plummet under uh, Richard Nixon uh, because of scandals, and numerous other presidents have had scandals as well. Um, and also media, another factor is the media portrays mistakes by government agencies. They, they highlight them. And you might think they've always done that, but not really maybe to the same extent. There's, the media have become quite confrontational with uh, federal government officials, especially presidents. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not really saying it is a bad thing, but it does often, I mean, because we want our officials to be scrutinized by the media, certainly. But sometimes... Um, if they have, they have what we sometimes call a bad news bias, where they focus mainly on things that are wrong and not on things that have gone well. And that can affect public opinion. Another thing is that politicians themselves have often campaigned as outsiders. They run against Washington. Most recently, you, you heard uh, Trump do this. He constantly talks about draining the swamp and all this sort of thing. In other words, he ran against Washington. And so when people hear politicians uh, criticizing Washington, they often think, well, they, they must know, you know, they are there. 
and you know sometimes for certain types of candidates campaigning against Washington works for them so they do it another thing is that um, corporate interests and wealthy people have created uh, think tanks and uh, other sorts of institutions foundations that spend you know the oceans of money millions billions of dollars uh, putting out reports and putting people on the news to attack government regulation to attack the whole idea of taxation to criticize um, uh, the functioning of the government because it gets in the way of uh, doing whatever they want. In other words, if you know big corporations and wealthy people don't particularly want to pay taxes or, or have their businesses regulated by the federal government, and, and to prevent that, they attack the government sometimes. One of the most vocal opponents of the federal government was Ronald Reagan. He said famously, government is, isn't the solution, government is the problem. And this was part and parcel of an ideological movement we sometimes call it neoliberalism, um, which is sort of an anti-government, pro-market forces a wave that went through many nations, including the U.S., from the late 70s to the present. Um, I think of it as privatism, basically an ideology that says the private sector always does it better, government's always wasteful, and so forth. And people are so accustomed to just hearing that, that they accept it uncritically. They don't even think of whether it's true or not. They don't try to find out whether it's true. They just believe it because they hear it from so many sources. Um, my position on it uh, is that this is nonsense, that the government, I don't, I don't believe that. I mean, you can believe whatever you want, of course, but um, it, I, I don't see how anyone can study what the federal government actually does uh, and what state and local governments do for that, for, for the, um, you know, from that standpoint. I don't see how you can look at, uh, at what they actually do and conclude that governments are wasteful and... Um, inefficient. And, and I'll explain to you what I mean by that, because if they're doing the tasks that they're designed to do, then governments can be quite effective. Of course, if you have governments do things they're not good at, that's another story. But this book that I'm having you read talks about some very important things that the government does. And, you know, I just think these appeals often work because people, Americans, don't know what the government does. And so they are susceptible to these appeals, that it's wasteful, that it's inefficient, that it gets in people's way, that it's regulating too much, that it's too big, and so forth. Without evidence, they just believe it because they hear it so much. Um, and so what I want to take a few minutes with uh, you here about is, is what the government does and what types of tasks it can undertake, and then talk a bit about the fifth risk. Um, because in reality... The U.S. government does things, for the most part, that businesses can't do or won't do. And in many cases, they're doing things that business wants government to do. Um, and so they're usually not in competition with business. They're doing tasks that the private sector or businesses would not do anyway, because there's no way they can make a profit from them. And we sometimes call that market failure. Market failure means um, it, does, it isn't really a failure as such. It, it refers to things where markets aren't going to work, where you just can't rely on the markets to get a task done because they're not going to do it. Uh, there's, there's no way they can profit from it. And I'll sh show you what I mean in just a minute with a, with a, a two-by-two two table. And um, the other reason often the government has to do things is to pay for them. Uh, there's what we call a collective action problem where something needs to be done, but you can't make people pay for it. Um, and so you have to tax them. And where you need to tax people or where you have a task that has to be done, but the market isn't going to take care of it, then if, if the government doesn't do it, nobody's going to do it. Now, this, um, what I'm showing you here, this is a very commonly used classification system. It comes mainly out of economics or um, study of public policy. We classify goods, and it, this may look confusing, but it, it's actually pretty... Uh, intuitive, if you just think about it for a minute. So this is a four by four table. You say, wait a minute, six by six. <laughs> well, it really isn't. I mean, three by three. It's not really three by three. It's two by two because the the top line and the and the left side are just labels. Um, so let's take the top. What do I mean by rivalrous goods and non-rivalrous goods? The term rivalrous is a fancy word for something that where when one person consumes some of it, there is less for others to consume. So like if you go to the store and you want to buy water, uh, bottled water, and someone comes rushing in because they think there's going to be a, a drought or something or a tornado, and they buy all the water, well, there's no more water left for you to buy, right? But some goods, and so that's rivalrous. That's a rivalrous product. If one person uses it, 
it, it reduces the total supply so there's less for other people. So people can, in a sense, compete or be rivals for it. Non-rivalrous goods are ones where one person consumes it, it doesn't reduce the supply for others. Like, for example, if one person watches cable TV, it doesn't mean your neighbor can't watch it. It doesn't reduce the supply. If one person uses the Wi-Fi at UIC, that doesn't reduce the amount of Wi-Fi that you can use. It doesn't run out. So that's what rivalrous and non-rivalrous means. Pretty simple, right? And then the other side is excludability. That's, that's even simpler. Can you exclude people from consuming the good or not? If you, if you can exclude them, we call it excludable. And if you can't exclude them, we say it's non-excludable. Well, uh, if, when, you go to this, when you go to the store to, to buy products, I mentioned water, whatever it is, you have to pay for it. They can make you pay for it because they can prevent you from consuming it unless you pay for it. They'll arrest you. They'll block you from leaving the store. But there are some goods, and I mentioned water, so let's stick with that. The bottle of water, they can keep you from, from leaving the store with it. Um, but what about the water in the sea? Um, what about the air that we breathe? You see, no one can stop you from consuming those resources. And so they're what we call non-excludable. And when you put this together, you get four different kinds of good. Private goods are the ones we normally buy in the market. And we don't want our government to normally to, um, to do this because we know that a market, uh, you know, business corporations and so forth, will, will supply these goods. And they, why? Because they can make a profit from it. How? They can package it and they can sell it and they can exclude people from consuming it. And so the, the only government role for that is facilitating the operation of the market. Good, you know, weights and measures and a monetary system and enforcing the laws of contract and so forth. And that's all the government needs to do there to keep that functioning. Let's go to the bottom right, public goods. These are the things that are non-rivalrous and non-excludable. You can't prevent people from consuming them. If they are being provided, they're being provided for everyone. And, uh, and their consumption of one doesn't reduce the supply for others. Uh, what do we mean by that? Well, national defense. You know, the military, uh, U.S. military, if they defend uh, the country, they defend the whole country. And you can't prevent people from consuming it. And when they defend uh, the country, they defend all of us, and it doesn't reduce the supply for anyone. So the, the, pub, the role of the government there is, in most cases, if it won't get done unless the government does it. I mean, who's going to provide national defense for profit? It doesn't really work that way. Sure, they might su supply you know, security for rich people, but who's going to defend the whole United States of America? Who's going to build an entire interstate highway system? Who's going to maintain the national parks and so forth? Who's going to do these things? And the only way to get people to pay for it is through taxation. Those are public goods. So we have private goods and public goods. But then there actually are some in-between categories. I mentioned uh, cable TV. It's what we call club goods. Um, it's where um, you can exclude people, but they're non-rivalrous. I mentioned cable TV. Um, the cable company can say, you don't have cable, so they can exclude you. You don't pay, they'll cut off your cable. But everyone who has a cable connection can consume it without reducing the supply. And common pool resources. This is a very important uh, area for government because it is basically the environment. It falls into the realm of common pool resources where um, we, uh, we can damage and reduce and eradicate the supply. We can catch all the codfish in the sea. We can catch all the tuna. We can destroy fisheries. But the problem is you can't exclude people from getting at them. So government has to regulate these things or they will be depleted. And that is sometimes referred to as the tragedy of the commons, that uh, some goods can be, uh, that are valuable and very important to us, common pool resources, can be overconsumed and even destroyed and eliminated entirely if government doesn't prevent people from overusing them. So, you know, in each of these sectors, there's a different role for government. But government, you know, has some role to play in common pool resources, a regulatory role, a very limited role with private goods and club goods, and a very important role of providing public goods. And these are all things that government needs to do different, uh, in different ways, depending upon the nature of the goods. So who is Michael Lewis? Michael Lewis is a very popular author. Some of you may have read some of his books. Um, the Fifth Risk is the one we're reading, but he's got a new one out called The Premonition, which is about the um, massive 
failures of U.S. policy in the COVID pandemic. Um, but I think The Fifth Risk, for our purposes, is the best book that he's written. He's written other books, uh, The Big Short, which is about the collapse of the housing market in 08, Moneyball, which is about sports and, uh, and other things. He's a, he's a very interesting author. Um, you can, if you want to, you can find easily on YouTube, whatever, an interview with him or something. Uh, he has an MA in economics from the London School of Economics and used to be a bond analyst for a company called Solomon Brothers. In The Fifth Risk, he argues that the government, and especially the federal government, it protects us against many risks that most of us do not even know exist. And he's trying to convey to us uh, what he learned when he began studying the transition from the Obama administration to the Trump administration. What he learned was that the Trump administration uh, began staffing the highest levels of government agencies with people who wanted to destroy the agencies. The people Trump brought into the government, and Trump himself, do not understand <clears throat> or appreciate the value of these uh, federal government agencies. And because they did not appreciate <clears throat> the value of them, they did not see even why they should continue to exist. So um, some of the people running them actually were de determined to destroy them. And that's what I'm going to briefly cover here. I won't spend a lot of time on it. But <clears throat> first, a couple, again, I want to show you some pictures. On the left, that's Chris Christie. He's an important person. He was the head of Trump's transition team for quite a while until they fired him and replaced him with Mike Pence because Chris Christie, well, I guess, was doing too good a job and took the job too seriously. Because he, I mean, tr uh, Chris Christie's a former governor of uh, New Jersey. He's a Republican, a conservative Republican, but he's a very smart man. And uh, he knew exactly what the transition team was all about, and he tried to do a very good job with it, and they fired him for it. Um, Max Steyer, as you'll see, I'll jump to him, he helped to get the laws passed that require presidential transition teams to take place. Um, he uh, helped to get laws put in place that guaranteed the existence of office space and resources, etc., and to... Um, require a sitting president to prepare to hand the government over to the next president in line. So in line with all that, <clears throat> Obama prepared transition teams and extensive briefing books for every single agency of the federal government and was ready to go with it. And as you'll see, if you read the book, um, Trump didn't even know that he had to have it. He had to have a transition team. So Obama had a transition team in every agency, and Trump was supposed to have one, and he didn't have one, and he didn't even know he needed one. This is after he was elected. And when he was told he had to have one, uh, he was absolutely furious, because he says, wait a minute, how, how, am I supposed to pay for this, you know, out of my money, and so forth. So um, ultimately, Chris Christie was made the head of it. As I said, they, they eventually um, fired him from that role and put in Mike Pence. And um, as you re will read or have read, in many cases, nobody from Trump's transition team went to the agencies in question. They just sat there and really was no transition. And when people did show up, he would send, there would be one person, two people, and all the people they sent were hostile to the agency they were supposed to be learning about. Um, it is thought that the reason Trump fired Christie, uh, one re possible reason, is that it was Jared Kushner, um, his son-in-law, who hates him because Chris Christie used to be a U.S. attorney and for New Jersey, and he prosecuted uh, Kushner's father, who was a crook, but um, and went to prison. Uh, I, I believe that Trump pardoned um, him or um, exonerated him in some way or another, but he was convicted and sent to prison, uh, the elder Kushner was. Um, the, the other problem was that Christie really was trying to do a very good job with this and was and knew, knew how to do it, and that didn't make him popular with Trump's people. One of the key people in the transition team who... Um, is, I think, not mentioned, if I remember correctly, is not mentioned in The Fifth Risk, but this is a, an important person, is Peter Thiel. Uh, Peter Thiel is a, uh, one of the founders of PayPal. He's an exceptionally wealthy um, tech industry uh, multi-billionaire who, uh, as I said, was one of the co-founders of um, PayPal and is on the board of uh, Facebook, etc. And... Um, he is, was an early endorser of Trump. Uh, he, um, I guess early is a relative term, but most of the people in 
Silicon Valley were not Trump supporters, and he was, a, a, by their standards, an early Trump supporter. Um, and uh, he endorsed Trump and argued that he uh, had a lot to say and had a lot of good ideas for the country. So as this article from CNN notes, he's a, he's a, a libertarian. He has uh, been trying to find a way to make people immortal and uh, develop floating cities uh, that would be outside the reach of any government. In other words, that would not be part of any nation or have any government at all and argues that people should not go to college uh, etc. So he has a lot of um, somewhat unusual ideas. He's highly, obviously, highly intelligent, and um, and an entrepreneur. And his he was one of the main advocates uh, of staffing government agencies with people who wanted to destroy them, which is a thing that Trump proceeded to do. And if, as you read, you can see how that happened. Um, Lewis just focuses on three agencies. Now he could have talked about others because the head of the Department of Education. Uh, Betsy DeVos was determined to destroy it. In fact, she wants to destroy public education entirely and have people go to private schools. And I, I, we could go on with many agencies of the federal government. Trump's uh, appointees, uh, in, in most cases, except for, say, like the Department of Defense or something, many of the agencies, they were vehement opponents of the agency they were heading, and they damaged them as much as they possibly could. And uh, the, But these are the three he focuses on, the Department of Energy, the Department of Agriculture, and the Department of Commerce. And the reason I think he chose these three is because most of us or people don't even know what they do. And uh, Lewis's point is they protect us against risks that most of us don't know much about. So let me just take a few minutes on each. And again, I'm in large part trying to show you who these people are. You can just see them, and then when you read their names in the book, you can say, oh, I saw that person's picture. That's what they look like. And kind of put a name with a face and maybe helps you remember them better. Um, one of the key people that, I guess the key person that Trump sent to the Department of Energy was this man, uh, Thomas Pyle. What does he do for a living? He's a lobbyist for the oil industry. The Coke Industries is an oil company, a privately held oil company. And this is the guy they sent over, you know, as the landing team. He's not a guy, now you may say, oh, well, you know, Department of Energy, sure, that makes sense. Yeah, except for the key problem here is the Department of Energy has very little to do with oil, as you'll see in a minute. Um, Obama's Secretary of Energy was a physicist by the name of Ernest Moniz, that's him on the left, a, P a very famous physicist with a PhD from Stanford who helped to negotiate the Iran nuclear arms deal. As you can see, the Department of Energy actually has very little to do with oil. Um, Trump's uh, Secretary of Energy was this guy on the right, uh, Rick Perry, the former uh, governor of Texas with a bachelor's degree in animal science from Texas A&M. So I think it's useful to have a side-by-side -side comparison of these two as head of the Department of Energy. Um, now, what did Rick Perry know about the Department of Energy? Let's talk about that for just a second. Uh, I have a video that I have put in your um, in the folder for this week that I'd like you to look at. It's uh, Rick Perry at a debate in 2011. He ran for president um, back in the, leading up to the 2012 election. And uh, during one of the debates, uh, he said that if he was, became president, he was going to eliminate three federal agencies. He says, it's three agencies of the government that when I get there, that are gone, he said. There's commerce, he's going to eliminate the Department of Edu uh, Commerce, Depart Education, and the, uh, and he said, what's the third one there? Let's see. So uh, what happened at that point was that uh, Ron Paul, who was also running for president, tried to help him out and said, did you mean the EPA? And he said, no, no, it wasn't EPA. And then, so then the, the host said, oh, wait a minute, you know, what's the third agency? Is EPA the one you were talking about? And he said, no, sir. Uh, and then Harwood said, well, can you name the third agency that you claim you're going to eliminate? And he couldn't. He said, I, I can't. And that's when he said, oops. It was famous for the oops moment. So the department, and it, it was the Department of Energy, his campaign and literature showed that the th that was the third agency. He just didn't know what his own positions were. Uh, so what happened to him? Well, um, a few years later, after Trump was elected, Rick Perry became the secretary of the Department of Energy, the department that he could not remember the name of, nominated by then-President Trump. Now, why did he do that? Because Trump and his advisors, as evidenced by what I just showed you, who put, they, put, they sent a, an oil industry lobbyist over to be their transition guy at Energy, they actually thought that the Department of Energy was about the fossil fuel industry. And why send Rick Perry? Because he's from Texas, and they have oil in Texas. 
I mean, this of course makes absolutely no sense, but that's what they did. What does the Department of Energy really do? Well, they have a $30 billion budget and they spend half of it on maintaining and guarding the nuclear arsenal of the United States. They do things like trying to find lost nuclear weapons, and there's a lot of those around. Uh, weapons, uh, we excuse me, weapons grade plutonium um, and, and other uh, material. There's a lot of that around because the, when the uh, Soviet Union fell apart in, uh, I guess, 1991, there were nuclear weapons scattered around republics that became independent of the Soviet Union, and a number of things went missing. Um, I don't know that there are ever, I don't know that there are any missing nuclear weapons. I, I have heard of some that might have been lost at sea uh, from airplane from um, bombers or uh, planes, missiles, that sort of thing. They just were lost. Uh, that may be true. It may not be true. But there's a lot of material missing, like nuclear waste. Um, Weapons-grade plutonium, uranium, this sort of thing. Things that could be used for dirty bombs, as they're called. Well, um, you know, as, as the book points out, uh, during an uh, eight-year period, they found enough uh, lost material to build 160 nuclear weapons. Uh, they train atomic energy inspectors in countries all over the world that have nuclear energy, uh, and they keep track of nuclear waste. This is obviously extremely important, nuclear energy nuclear waste. And they also uh, try to promote the um, uh, growth of alternative energy uh, sources and efficiency in the use of energy. They gave grants that were used to help Tesla get going, the solar power industry, and enormously important industry now for us is fracking, which um, means uh, trying to obtain um, natural gas uh, basically a fossil fuel product by uh, essentially cracking open uh, the ground in, in certain specific ways with chemicals and uh, water and so forth. So, you know, this is in part designed to reduce our dependence on other forms of energy. So what do they deal with? They, uh, they deal with things other than oil. And they put an oil, an oil guy in charge of it. Um, the Office of Science deals with nuclear weapons and also climate change. There, see, these, now these are long-term risks, and the um, you have uh, people engaged in risk analysis. And this John McWilliams becomes an important figure in the book because he's the guy who comes up with this notion of the fifth risk. These are a couple of the people: Aram Majumdar. Um, here's just a couple of examples of what they do. Here's the Hanford site in Washington State. They, for many years, produced plutonium for the U.S. nuclear arsenal. 60,000 weapons. It's decommissioned. Nine nuclear reactors and five plutonium processing complexes now housing two-thirds of the U.S. nuclear waste. Now, that is one of the things that the Department of Energy protects us against. How many people know about that? Um, you know, 177 storage tanks, 200, excuse me, 25 million cubic feet of solid waste and all sorts of contaminated groundwater. Now, there are all sorts of risks that come out of this. Um, one, one of the risks is contamination of uh, groundwater and contamination of, um, of soils. So that's one thing they do. It's a thing that uh, Rick Perry knew absolutely nothing about. And he was, during his confirmation hearings, amazingly, he was confirmed. Um, he expressed a certain amount of embarrassment. And I remember listening to the, the hearings, and I remember hearing him say that, well, he had a new appreciation for the agency. And, you know, to his credit, I think he did. Um, uh, I think that, you know, he, he went into it, as you know, saying that he was going to eliminate it. But I think after he um, learned what the agency did, he, he did develop a new respect for it. Um, but what do we mean by the fifth risk? This is McWilliams talks about this. He talks about certain types of risks, the risk of nuclear accidents, the risk of nuclear proliferation, North Korea, Iran, and so forth. And, and the department uh, was heavily involved in that, right? Department of Energy heavily involved in these things. Um, but there's also a, a, a thing, a, the, a special type of risk that I think applies to all these agencies and in fact to politics in general the role of our national government, which is the risk that you, that you don't even know exists. Um, because sometimes you don't want to know things. <laughs> the, the term used is willful ignorance, where um, 
sometimes in the short term, you're better off not knowing the cost of something. As they say, there's an upside to ignorance and a downside to knowledge. If you know that there is a risk, then you have to do something about it. But if you don't know the risk exists, you can blindly go along your way, not expending energy, not expending money, not expending time, protecting yourself against the risk because you've made sure that you don't know that the risk even exists. And it's a justification for not letting the scientists do their work and inform us of what are the risks really are. Now I'll go pretty quickly through uh, the rest of this, uh, these other chapters, just to let you see who the people are that Obama had in office and who were thrown out. Um, one of them is uh, Ali Zaidi. Uh, he is, he was uh, Obama's deputy director for energy policy. And so he was in the Domestic Policy Council, which is part of the White House. And he was also in the Office of Management and Budget. What did he do? Um, he helped to develop and work on policies related to the supply of energy. Um, he tried to re reduce our dependence on foreign oil. Uh, he tried to promote adoption of alternative fuels, clean energy, etc. cetera. Uh, he's got, he was, of course, out of government during, Obama, during uh, the Trump administration. Under Biden, he's back. He is now the first, uh, it's a new office called the Deputy National White House, excuse me, the Deputy National White House Climate Advisor. I've got the word national in there twice. It's Deputy National White House Climate Advisor. So there you go. He's back in um, the saddle again. This is, I have organizational charts of all these departments so you can see. Um, here we have the department. And if you look at the, um, over here, see, I'm showing what I'm showing you now is the uh, Department of Agriculture. See, now over in the far left, you can see the Forest Service. I've circled the Forest Service. That's one thing they do. Uh, and then rural development. One of the little understood things that they do is try to um, shovel money and resources to rural America. There's also their functions in, preserve, in ma maintaining the quality of our food and in promoting research on... Um, everything pertaining to agriculture, uh, food, the economics of it, and so forth. And these are many, and uh, the undersecretary for marketing, et cetera. The point is, what, what he's trying to get across to you is, many of the things that this department does um, are things that benefit us in ways we don't even know about. And in fact, that benefit businesses in ways that they may not even know about. Um, this is Trump's transition guy here uh, for agriculture. He is a lobbyist. He was the head of a group called Protect the Harvest, which is an anti-humane society group. The Humane Society advocates for the humane treatment of animals. And Klippenstein says, no, uh, we shouldn't worry about protecting animals. He was the whole Trump transition team for agriculture. Um, you know, and it gets the same sort of pattern. These are some of the people who, who um, were interviewed for the fifth risk. This is Kevin uh, Con Cannon. He was um, under Secretary for Food, Nutrition, and Consumer Sciences under Obama. Why? What, what's the point here? This whole uh, section of the Department of Agriculture had to do with nutrition and food security. Uh, and the programs served as much as one quarter of the nation. School lunches. Department of Agriculture, and on and on. You can you can read this for yourself. But um, this is was his his real interest, and this is about food security. Um, Kathy Wateki is another one of the people that uh, he interviewed. She's her field against food science and human nutrition. She's as you can see a very distinguished person with an excellent background. Basically, these people are what they're essentially scientists. Um, and Lillian Salerno, her whole thing was rural development. She, she had a deep commitment to economic development in rural America. Um, and now we go to the Department of Commerce, the third department. Uh, Catherine Sullivan was an astronaut. She's one of the people that Obama had in power, a very distinguished person with a PhD in geology. Again, these people are what? They're scientists. Um, and one of the things he wants, uh, Lewis wants to highlight for us about the Department of Commerce, I mean, the, I mean, the Department of Commerce does many, many things. One of them is the U.S. Census, which um, you know, is being tabulated right now, I guess, and analyzed, put out in reports. But this is incredibly important for 
business and uh, um, social science. But I've put a little box around NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, that, um, again, who knew that was in the Department of Commerce? And what sorts of things do they do? Well, um, here is weather forecasting, among other things. And here's DJ Patil, who is, a, a, again, what? A scientist, a mathematician in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, who, whose interests and accomplishments are in the area of weather forecasting and predicting threats. Now, you, we have, every year we hear about tornadoes, hurricanes, and so forth, other weather events, uh, destroying communities and uh, setting, destroying people's homes, their lives, and so forth. Wouldn't it be nice if we could do a better job of protecting against those threats? Well, who did um, Trump put in, in as head of uh, NOAA, or to try to head NOAA? Um, it was a man by the name of Barry Myers, who was the CEO of AccuWeather. What is AccuWeather? Uh, essentially a private company that was busy using um, material gathered from the government to peddle their services of weather forecasting. In other words, doing what the government does, using the government's data, but selling it. And so what do they want? They want to stop NOAA from giving it away for free so they can sell it for money. Uh, David Friedberg, I'll skip over this and just get down to because one more thing I wanted to point out here before I let you go. I, I don't. This is going longer than I expected. Again, another PhD in geography and a master's in meteorology. Uh, what what was she all about in um, NOAA? Protecting people against tornadoes, tornado warnings. Um, Art Allen, the last person I'll talk about here. His, his job was rescuing people. And he, he came up with a, a modeling program to predict where people who had been lost at sea would be found, saving thousands of lives. Now, there's no uh, private corporation that's going to take on that responsibility. There's no way they can make any money off that. And, but he did it, and now we have it. And he was furloughed as a non-essential government employee during the Trump government shutdown. Again, what is he? Scientist. Last thing I'll talk with you about <clears throat> is the National Security Council briefly. Um, and uh, it has to do with pandemics. There's a topic on that everyone knows something about, right? Back in 2014, 2016, there was an epidemic in Africa, in the countries of Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea, of a disease called Ebola, which is almost always fatal. It's a horrible disease, um, and it's highly contagious. So highly contagious and almost always fatal, or usually fatal. So um, the World Health Organization and the United States coordinated a, an intense response, and they, it was quite successful, I, I, I think. Uh, they contained the epidemic. It did not spread worldwide, which was the concern that it would spread worldwide. They contained it, uh, brought it to a halt. Now, Ebola has popped out elsewhere in a couple of other African countries. It, it's, it's never been eradicated. I don't want to create that impression. It has not been eradicated, but it has been contained. And and uh, and World Health Organization and the U.S. government uh, have found ways to do that. Under Obama, they thought, well, we, we need to prevent future pandemics. You know, we need to do something about this so we'll be ready next time. So they created a special office called the Office of the Senior Director for Global Health Security to deal with pandemics. And it was a new part of something called the National Security Council, which is an agency that operates in the White House under the direction of the president. Um, well, when Trump came in, he, instead of having, you know, someone in there who knew what he was doing, he brought in John Bolton. Um, a man who had been bouncing around Washington under Republican administrations for a long time, who dissolved the directorate that was in charge of global health security. And so there was nobody in the National Security Council to coordinate the U.S. governmental response to the coronavirus. And he also eliminated all the people who were dealing with cyber attacks and climate change. Now, you know we've had all kinds of problems from cyber attacks and climate change, 
and a massive coronavirus pandemic, understand there was a person in a position in the National Security Council to coordinate our response to that, to those things, and Trump had him fired by John Bolton. And along comes COVID. This is what it looked like in 2020. And of course, now if I showed you the same map, it'd be completely bright red. Um, last slide I'll show you shows you how well we have done uh, in this. As of, uh, you know, uh, early 2022, um, we find ourselves, uh, found ourselves with um, 58 million cases and 850,000 deaths will certainly go considerably higher. When citizens in a whole group of um, industrialized nations were polled and asked, you know, who did a good job dealing with the coronavirus outbreak, Germany, the World Health Organization, China, the EU, European Union, or the US, um, the overall median response from all these countries was 61% uh, felt that Germany did a good job, 58% thought that the World Health Organization did a good job, 49% thought China did a good job, 48% thought the EU did a good job, and only 37% thought the US did. In fact, there isn't anyone that thinks the US did a good job on this. So, um, and, I, and I, I ask you to take a look at the line where they asked the Americans in the US. Um, Americans came in the same way, 71%. They, Americans said Germany did a better job than we did. We only got 42% rating from Americans who were surveyed. So I just, final thoughts are, um, when you read, as you read and think about and talk about this book, understand that and we're gonna talk coming up next week about a little bit more about what the government does for you. But this is to highlight the um, importance of the federal government in one particular way, which is to protect us against risks that most of us don't even know exist. And if we don't even know they exist, how can we appreciate the government that protects us against them when the people who do them operate uh, out of our view? We don't know what they do. We don't know who they are. But we can at least maybe, I hope, learn to appreciate that the federal government is there for particular reasons. The same thing for state and local governments. They are there for reasons. They are not there just to employ people. They have functions. They do things. And they make... Um, uh, and they have an impact on our lives in many important ways. And so this book just highlights some of those. So with that, I hope you enjoy the book and I hope it provides a lot of uh, opportunities for you to discuss these things with um, your fellow students. Bye-bye.